Well, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be in chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3 today as we begin our series of lessons here. We are beginning our year-long look at the church defined, trying to understand what is the church, what is it supposed to be, what is it supposed to do, what's it supposed to be about. And the reality is that the reason why we're asking this question at this time is because our fellowship is at a bit of a crossroads. It's been a very interesting five years. A lot's happened in the last five years of our fellowship. A lot of changes have occurred. We've literally moved church buildings a couple of times, actually. And the makeup of our fellowship has changed drastically. The backgrounds and histories and theological backgrounds of many of us in this room have changed over that time. And so it's important that as we come to this juncture where things have really kind of settled, we're settling into our new location in our city and community and understanding what we're supposed to do when we're here, we need to ask and answer with conviction the question of what is the church? And based on that answer, we then need to ask, how are we supposed to look like that? How do we get to looking like that? Now, this year-long look at the church defined is actually going to be broken into several smaller series of lessons, and I fully expect, to be honest with you, that these are going to be challenging lessons for all of us at one point or another. For those of you who maybe have less experience in the church than others, uh, you might have certain ideas and expectations about what you think the church is, what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to be like, and as we look at the Scriptures, hopefully your exposure to the Scriptures will show you more authentically what the church is supposed to be about. And for those of you who've been in the church a long time, to be honest with you, you might be challenged too. A lot of your traditional understandings might be challenged, not just about the church, but other social groups in relation to the church. A lot of different things might challenge your views in this particular year of the church for us. But our hope is that ultimately, It is for our good and for the glory of God that we take this time to really understand what is the church so that He can be glorified in our city and surrounding communities as we go out and be the church. Now, the first series of lessons we're going to be doing in this look at the church is called The Image of God, Representing the Lord. We're going to be taking this first part of this series very slowly, line by line, piece by piece. We're going to begin by looking at the concept of the image of God. And I would ask you to bear with me because it's going to be several weeks of me not really talking too much about the church. Because what we're going to see is that this concept of the image of God actually undergirds everything about the purpose of the church and what it is supposed to do. However, as we come to our text today in Genesis chapter 1, our intention is to understand this. If man was created as the image of God, then we need to understand the God of the image. The one being imaged, what is he like? And so we're going to look at that today, see what his priorities are, what his concepts for being the image actually are. And so we're going to begin here in Genesis chapter 1 and work through again Genesis chapter 2, verse 3 in this prologue to the book of Genesis. So we read here, beginning in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God caused the separation between the light and between the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it be for a separating between waters from waters. And God made the expanse and caused the separation between the waters which were under the expanse and between the waters which were over the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heavens. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered unto one place, and let the dry ground be seen. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land, and the gathering of waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land cause vegetation to sprout, a plant yielding seed, a fruit tree making fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in it upon the land. And it was so. 
And the land brought forth vegetation, a plant yielding seed according to its kind, and a tree making fruit whose seed is in it according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to cause a separation between the day and between the night. And let them be for signs and for appointed times and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the land. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the great light to have dominion over the day and the small light to have dominion over the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the land and to rule in the day and in the night and to cause a separation between the light and between the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm of swarms of living beings and let a flying thing fly over the land, over the face of the expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea monster and all living, creeping things, creeping beings, with which the waters swarm according to their kind, and every winged flying thing according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and increase and fill the waters and the seas, and the flying thing increase in the land. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the land bring forth a living being according to its kind, a beast and a creeping thing, and a being of the land according to its kind. And it was so. And God made a being of the land according to its kind, and the beast according to its kind, and every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man as our image according to our likeness, and let him rule over fish of the sea, and over flying things of the heavens, and over the beasts, and over all the land, and over every creeping thing creeping upon the land. And God created man as his image, as the image of God he created, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and increase, and fill the land, and subdue it, and rule over fish of the sea, and over flying things of the heavens, and over every being creeping upon the land. And God said, Behold, I give to you every plant sowing seed which is upon the face of all the land, and every tree which in it is fruit of the tree sowing seed according to their kind. It will be for food. And to every being of the land, and to every flying thing of the heavens, and to every creeping thing upon the land in which life is in it, every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all which he had made, and behold, it was exceedingly good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their host. And God had completed in the seventh day his work which he had made, and ceased in the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because in it he ceased from all his work which God created to do. Brothers and sisters, we come before a holy and awesome God. And we're coming to His Word today, His blessed and wonderful Word. So let us not come rashly or carelessly or quickly, but let us guard our steps as we approach Him and His Word this day and seek His guidance and His Holy Spirit as we enter into a time of study in His Word. Holy, awesome, glorious God. Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Enthroned in majesty and splendor, clothed in light, we praise you. We praise you that you have delivered this, your word, to us by the power and guidance of your Holy Spirit. That you have recorded this word by the hand of your prophet Moses and preserved it for us to this day that we might study the word of our God and know the God of the Word. And so we pray during this time, Lord, that you would deal bountifully with your slaves, that we may live and keep your Word, and open our eyes to see wonderful things from your instruction. Guide us into the truth. Help us to see clearly and respond wisely in faithful obedience and the power of your Holy Spirit. Conform us to the image of God in Christ, that we might make you and your salvation known to the lost and dying. I pray for the sake of your people and for myself that you would speak to your people, that I would not speak from the empty arrogance of my knowledge, and that if I should try to speak for myself, that my tongue would cleave to the roof of my mouth. Speak to your people in this time, Lord, that they would be equipped 
edified and encouraged. And that above all else, you would be honored and glorified and praised. We pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus the Christ, our King. Amen. When we come to a familiar text such as Genesis chapter 1, we need to take a step back and carefully consider the context. Because the reality is when we think of ancient Israel in bondage in Egypt, we often have this picture in our mind because of films we've seen or other books that we've read that the Israelites were in their slavery faithfully attempting to serve God faithfully crying out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for deliverance, and faithfully looking to him in a pagan nation and worshiping him only. But the reality is this is simply not the case. What we see in the rest of the scriptures is that the people of Israel, once they had entered into Egypt around the year 1663, as Joseph was ruling as sort of second in command of the kingdom of Egypt, they began during that time period to slowly descend into the beliefs, the practices, the idolatry, and the worldview of the Egyptians. This becomes clear, especially from the prophet Ezekiel, that this is exactly what happened to them. And so when they did come out of Egypt in the Exodus, came into the wilderness, led by Moses, it was necessary that they be essentially re-educated in who this Yahweh Elohim is, who this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob actually is. And so, not only does Moses write Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to record the word of God for God's people, but he also writes this book, Genesis, which is essentially a reintroduction of God to the people of Israel. Not that he didn't know them, but they had clearly forgotten who he was. And so when we come to a book that is a reintroduction of relationship, we need to understand that some of the first statements that are made in that book are extremely important. They lay a foundation, a foundational understanding of who this God is, so that as they move forward, they have this understanding in their mind the entire time. And so what we're going to see today is this God, what he is about, what his concerns are, what he is like. And what we're going to see as the weeks unfold is that this same concern, the same sort of nature that God reflects in Genesis chapter 1, he expects man to reflect as well. But before we go there, we're going to look today at the idea that the Lord God is profoundly driven to bring light to darkness, life to lifelessness, and peace to chaos. In our text for today, we're going to see the person, nature, and work of a God who demonstrated his concern that his creation be filled with light, life, and peace. And what we're going to see as we move forward is that this same concern falls upon his purpose for man. So let's turn to our text again and let's start to look at the nature, the character, the person, and the works of this God so we can understand better what he expects of his people. So begin here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, reading very well-known sentence here, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And this sentence basically serves as a heading to the prologue of chapter 1 into chapter 2, verse 3. Remember, the chapters and verses are not inspired. They were added much, much later for referencing purposes. And, uh, and so they're not exactly perfect all the time. So this section actually runs from the first sentence to verse 3 of chapter 2 for a whole section. And it's this declaration in the first sentence, where we learn that this God created all things from absolutely nothing. And that is, that is basically impossible for our minds to conceive, that a God could do such a thing, to take something that is absolutely nothing, and then to just speak and suddenly things just exist. It is a remarkable statement that is made here. And it's an important one. But for our purposes today, it's when we come to the second sentence that we find something very important for this passage overall. It's a very abrupt change in the text in the second sentence. We read this. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
So the beginning of this second sentence is actually used as a Hebrew grammatical element to indicate a very significant break in the text. It's a, it's a grammatical element that's used to draw your attention to a very specific point being made. And admittedly, it's very abrupt and very sudden because we're only on the second sentence of the text, and yet we run into this element here. And so the author is trying to grab your attention and say, now look, you need to pay attention here because there's an issue And so we actually see that what God first brought forth to creation actually had three problems. First of all, it was a formless mass of water and matter. Second of all, it was devoid of any kind of life. And third, it was covered and penetrated by a complete darkness. Now, the only way I've been able to depict this in the past is this image here. You sort of imagine this uh, this glob, enormous glob, mind you, of, of matter and waters and, and darkness is over it, and it's completely chaotic and without form and being held together by just nothingness floating about in the void of space. So over the six days of creation, though, the Lord would slowly resolve these problems of chaos, lifelessness, and darkness by bringing into creation light, life, and peace. And in doing so, we will see the profound concern that God has for His creation and ultimately His purpose for man. So we begin here looking at the God of light. So into this darkness, God begins to intervene. And on the first day, He creates light. Light injected into this darkness and brings this light to resolve the issue and problem of darkness. On the fourth day, he creates what we call the luminaries, the light-giving bodies of the sun, moon, and stars. And these objects would give light to creation, to give light upon the land, to remove the darkness from it. But more than just this, what we begin to see in the Scriptures is a depiction of a God who is not just creating light, He is light Himself, the source of light. In Psalm 104, we read, My soul bless Yahweh, Yahweh my God, you are exceedingly great, and you are clothed of majesty, being wrapped of a light as a garment. In his first letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote that God was the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the only one having immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom none of men has seen nor is able to see. But here's the difficulty. Man comes into the world, and man sins, rebels, and disobeys God. And because of this, he brings darkness into the world. Now, it's not a darkness in the sense of an absence of physical light. It's at this point in the Scriptures that we begin to see darkness take on a more figurative sense. And we see it continue throughout the Scriptures. The darkness is something that penetrates to the heart of man in the form of lostness, deception, confusion, despair, falsehood, suffering. But here's the remarkable thing. Because of this shift to a figurative understanding of darkness, we see the Scriptures begin to describe the light of Yahweh in a figurative sense as well. It becomes deliverance from these figurative forms of darkness that man brought into creation in his fall. So we read, for instance, in Psalm 112, light rises in the darkness for the upright. The idea here is that the upright are struggling in lostness, deception, falsehood, confusion, despair, and suffering, and the light of God's deliverance comes to them. The prophet Micah said, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, for when I fall, I arise. For when I dwell in darkness, Yahweh is light for me. He's not dwelling in physical darkness. He's dwelling in lostness, deception, falsehood, confusion, despair, suffering. What's even more is the prophet Isaiah speaks of the ultimate version of this in the end time. When all has passed and the new heavens and the new earth come, the kingdom of God forever, the prophet Isaiah wrote this, The sun will no longer be for you for light by day. And the moon will not give light to you for brightness. Indeed, Yahweh will be for you light, everlasting. And your God will be for your glory. Your sun will no longer come and your moon will not wane because Yahweh will be for you for light everlasting and the days of your mourning will come to an end. 
Now, obviously, it's likely that this is a sense of Yahweh actually giving physical light to creation, but there's also a sense in which the figurative darkness of despair, deception, falsehood, confusion, all these sorts of things are being blasted away by the light of God in the end. We even see that the Word of God Himself gives light. In Psalm 119, we read a very familiar statement, a lamp for my foot is your word and a light for my path. Later on in that same psalm, one of my favorite verses, the opening of your words gives light, causing the simple to understand. The idea is that the person who is uneducated, unexposed to the Scriptures, not taught theology, not necessarily the brightest person ever, can still open the Word of God, and immediately upon first exposure, it will give light. The Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians called the very good news of Jesus the light of the glory of Christ. And we see again that this idea of the light of God is connected with salvation out of the darkness of sin and its consequences. Psalm 27, we read, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. From whom shall I fear? Yahweh is a stronghold of my life. From whom shall I tremble? The prophet Isaiah spoke thusly, uh, the people walking in darkness see a great light. The ones dwelling in a land of deep darkness, a light shines upon them. The idea being that people are living in this realm of despair and lostness and confusion and falsehood and deception and suffering, and a light's going to come to them. We find out who that light is later. The Apostle Peter in his first letter wrote this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for a possession, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of the one having called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we see that that light is Christ himself. He is the one who's brought true light, deliverance from sin, from lostness, falsehood, deception, despair, confusion, condemnation under the very wrath of God. The Apostle John, in his account of Jesus, recorded the words of our Lord when he said, I am the light of the world. The one following me should absolutely not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And Later on, he recorded the words of Jesus when he said, I have come into the world as light in order that everyone believing in me shall not remain in the darkness. You all know the danger of walking around in the dark, walking around boldly, in the dark. I lived uh, in a home in Northwest Houston, and one night, uh, this is before we moved back to Pampa, one night we're, uh, it's the middle of the night, pitch black, can't see a thing. I woke up and needed for some reason to leave the room to go into the living room or kitchen or go check on a child or what have you. And I'm walking pretty boldly out of my room, thinking the door's wide open and I can walk right out. And it's pitch black, I can't see anything. Unbeknownst to me, the door had been swung to a point where it was facing directly at me. And you can see what's coming. I was walking boldly through that room, heading where I was headed, and before I knew it, I felt this unbelievable pain right between my eyes when that door slammed into me. Felt the instant rattling of my entire skull, the enormous bright flash of light. Where was that light a second ago? Um, and then fell flat on my back in a tremendous amount of pain. And I learned a valuable lesson that night. Stop walking around so boldly in the darkness. We all know this. Apparently, I didn't know it well enough. But the problem is that we do the same thing in our lives. We walk around boldly in the darkness. And we wander into the very darkness which Christ came to deliver us from. We seek light on our own terms by what is right and good in our eyes, which is ultimately in the darkness. When seeking direction, especially in the context of the church, we look to the traditions of men so often, and we hear that oft-repeated phrase, well, that's just the way we've always done it. When seeking truth, how quickly do we run to the Scriptures? rather than running to the wisdom of philosophers or scholars or scientists or Google searches. And all of these fall short. 
Or let's be honest, there are times when you are legitimately broken and in despair and hurting, and you're looking for deliverance out of it, and you run to where? Online searches? Pundits? Politicians? Pontificators? Social media influencers? We look in all the dark places for light and walk boldly into them brazenly into them, when in reality the only light is found in Christ. We have to diligently seek the light from the true source of light. For those of you who might not have trusted in Christ as yet, we beg you to find light in Jesus. It's a light that never fades, and it gives hope in the darkest of dark. I I implore you day in and day out, Be reconciled to God in Christ and find that light in Him. Because everywhere else you seek light, everywhere else you seek deliverance from the pains and difficulties and confusions and despair of your existence, everywhere else you look is going to fall short. There is no source of light in this world that this world thinks it has to offer that is ultimately going to give you light rather than just more darkness. It is Christ alone who gives that light. And so that's why we call you to find light in Christ. Now, for those of you who have long walked with the Lord, you still need this light as well, because you still live in a world that brings upon you despair and confusion and pain and suffering and falsehood and deception and suffering. You know this, and our call is to remain in Christ to be in constant, close communion with Him, pouring our hearts out to Him in the midst of our darkness and finding light in Him alone and letting His words remain in you, that the light that His words give would bring you hope in the midst of your darkness. You need Him too, ongoing. You will never graduate from your need for light from Christ. And in this, as we see ever more the wonders of His light, we will rejoice and glorify Him because He is light. He is the God who is profoundly driven to bring light to darkness. But He's also the God of life. We begin this narrative of creation, this record of the created work, seeing lifelessness. There is no life to be had anywhere. And so on the third day, the Lord creates plants and trees. But He doesn't just leave the plants and trees unto themselves. He actually gives them the ability to reproduce. And thereby, He gives them the ability to continue to propagate further life beyond what He has given. On the fifth day, He creates the creatures of the sea and the sky. And again, He doesn't just leave them unto themselves. He gives them the ability to reproduce and further propagate life throughout creation. And what does He do on the sixth day? He creates the land creatures and He creates man, bringing life into creation and gives them the ability to reproduce, to bring and propagate more life into creation. So we see a God that is very much about life. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah said that Yahweh God, He is truly a living God and the King everlasting. And if He is a living God, then I assure you that He is very concerned about life in His creation. And this label of Him being a living God continues throughout the Scriptures. But again, man is created. Man sins, rebels, and disobeys God. But here's what is horrible about this. It's not just that man, like bringing darkness back into a lighted world. It's not that he brought lifelessness back into a life world or a living world. It's that he brought death, taking life and ending it. It brought something far worse than just simple lifelessness. It brought a profound all-encompassing death and decay. From the innermost depths of man's being, he was corrupted 
to the furthest points within, all the way out into his flesh, and yes, all the way out into creation as his sin and corruption echoed into the furthest reaches of God's created order. And then very quickly we begin to see the hatred of Yahweh for the violation of life. We see throughout the Scriptures the Lord working to preserve and propagate life in the midst of this dying world. In Torah, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we see a constant flow of regulations demonstrating the hatred of Yahweh for the violation of life. In Genesis chapter 4, we see judgment upon the first murderer, a judgment that it communicates that he takes life seriously. In Genesis chapter 9, we see a promise made to Noah for all mankind. The Lord said this, And surely for your blood, for your life, in other words, if your blood is shed and you're killed, I will seek. From the hand of every creature I will require it, and from the hand of a man, his brother, I will require the life of the man. The one shedding the blood of the man, by man his blood will be shed, for in the image of God he made the man. In other words, somehow, some way, if someone kills another, that one will be ended by another. Exodus chapter 20, also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments are recorded with, you shall not murder. We see a God who's concerned with the, pre- pro- excuse me, the preservation and propagation of life. When the brothers of Joseph came to Egypt to get help in the midst of a famine and they discovered Joseph there, second in command of Egypt, and, and all of the tribe, all of the nation of Israel was brought into Egypt for safety, they came there, they dwelled for a while until Jacob died. And when Jacob died, the brothers got very concerned that because Jacob was now dead, Joseph might seek revenge upon them. And when they came to Joseph, Joseph reassured them. And he said this, And now do not be grieved and do not be angry with your eyes because you sold me here. Being angry with your eyes is another way of saying in Hebrew, do not be angry with yourself. For God sent me before you for the preservation of life. Joseph was sent to Egypt to preserve the people of God, to preserve their lives. In Deuteronomy 6, we see that the Lord desired us to keep the commands so that the days would be long in the land. In Deuteronomy 30, he called upon the people to choose life by keeping the commandments. But ultimately, we find the full expression of life in the Lord Jesus. The Apostle John, in his account, records the the words of Jesus. He says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one believing in me, though he should die, he will live. And everyone living and believing in me absolutely should not die unto eternity. So this is a statement that indicates to us that eternal life is indeed a quantity of life. It is eternal, forever. But then a little bit later on, when Jesus is praying to the Father, while he's with his disciples on the night in which he was handed over, Jesus prayed this. Now, this is eternal life, that they, referring to the disciples, should know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So eternal life is not just quantity of life in terms of eternality, but it also has to do with quality of life, life that is in relationship with God, a life that is abundant and overflowing. That is also eternal life. Peter, when speaking before the leadership in Acts 3, told them that they had killed the very author of life. And the apostle John, in his first letter, wrote that this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life And this life is in His Son. The good news is that Jesus the Christ died, was buried, and raised again so that we might die in His death and be raised to newness of life in His resurrection. We're familiar in our area with the Mississippi kites that migrate here in the spring, stay through the summer, a little bit into the fall. But kites are known throughout the world and in Greece. And so, when the writer Aesop, famous for his fables, wrote of the kites, it's the same similar bird to what he's talking about, it's a different species, but he talked about the kites. And he wrote a story about the kites and the swans. You see, the kites in his story had the ability to sing like the swans. They had beautiful songs that they sang as well. But at one point, the kites became fascinated by another sound. 
they got fascinated with the sound of the horse whinnying. And they strove and strove to figure out how to make this sound, how to, how to get enjoyment and fullness out of that sound. And in the process, they lost their ability to sing like the swans. And this is very much like us. We seek liveliness and fullness and abundance of life in things that we think will bring us life, but ultimately we have sought life in the lifeless places of the world. You see, we grope for light in the dark places, but we also search for life in the lifeless places of the world. We see those who seek eternal youth through medicines, dietary regimens, supplements, exercise, cosmetics, and even surgeries. I mean, how long has man been searching for the fountain of youth? Quite literally looking for a fountain of youth in hundreds of years ago, now looking more for the metaphorical fountain of youth. Or we even think of one of the oldest stories in the world, the story of King Gilgamesh of Uruk, who after seeing his equal, his best friend in Kidu, die, realized he was mortal too. And so he went on the search for eternal life. And failing to do so, returned home and lived out his days in his kingdom. Or maybe you seek life and abundance of life in power, through political power perhaps, either locally or nationally. Or maybe you seek it interpersonally, power over others in your interpersonal relationships. Or maybe you even seek it in the church, trying to be prominent and powerful to give you liveliness in, in your existence here within the fellowship of God's people. If not, you may be just seeking prestige to give you abundance of life, to get popularity so that when others look at you, they say, well, we're going to defer to you, whatever you think is best, because we think you know best. You might do it in your families or your communities or on social media or, again, maybe even in the church, so that everybody in the church looks to you and says, oh, well, we'll just defer to whatever you want. But when all these things fail to give you life, an abundance of life, then we seek it in pleasure. Food, drink, sexuality, drugs, entertainment, and all manner of leisure. But in the end, as King Solomon found in my life verse, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's all empty and without meaning. Jesus is life. Jesus is life. Life in Christ is both quantity of life and quality of life. And we would do well to hear the words of our Lord, recorded by the Apostle Matthew first, for whoever should desire to save his life will lose it, but whoever should lose his life for my sake will find it. And then the Apostle John recorded something a little more pointed from Jesus when he said, the one loving his life loses it, and the one hating his life in this world will keep it unto eternal life. The idea being this, that clinging to life in our own way according to the ways of the world, by what the world says will give us life or abundance of life, will only result in the utter loss of it all. But letting go of our desperate grip on life in this age according to the wisdom of man so that we might cling to life in Christ only results in life eternal. Again, both quantitative length of time in life and qualitative in relationship with Him. And so for those of you who are trying to seek life elsewhere, in these sorts of things in the world, none of them are going to give you life. None of them are going to make you feel alive or give you meaning or abundance in life. If you do not know Jesus, you will not find life. And eventually eternal death will take you. This is why we call you to Jesus to find life in Him apart from death. But for those of you who have long walked with the Lord, you still need this life in Him because, again, it is not just about secured eternal life in His kingdom, although it is about that. It is also about quality of life in relationship with Him. And you will never plumb the depths of that relationship. And so you must pursue that life in Christ which draws you ever further into relationship with Him. We have light and life from a God who is profoundly driven to bring light to darkness and life to lifelessness. But we also have a God 
who is profoundly driven to bring peace to chaos. So in the scriptures, when we come to this word peace, uh, the Hebrew word is shalom. Now understand, shalom does not just mean absence of conflict. It does, but not just. That is more of an after effect. The idea of shalom, more importantly, is that it is a state of wholeness and completeness and settledness brought about through purposeful effort. And so what we see is God looks upon a chaotic creation and purposefully engages with it to bring it completeness and wholeness and settledness through His purposeful efforts in creation. So on the first day, we see Him separate between light and darkness, putting them in their proper abode, putting them where they belong in an ordered place. On the second day, we see the sky created to separate the waters above and the waters below, keeping them all in their assigned place, bringing order to creation. On the third day, we see something very similar. He separates the land and the sea, putting them in their proper place, separating them, bringing the the disjunct matter in the waters into one place to create land and then seas so that they are in their correct order and place. And then he creates plants reproducing according to their kind alone. Now, yes, that is bringing life. But notice that he he makes it so that they can only reproduce according to their kind. And what this does is this creates order within the context of life and the propagation of life. They can only reproduce according to their kind. They can't reproduce other things, only their kind. On the fourth day, The Lord creates the luminaries, the light-giving bodies, as signs bringing order to creation for days, for years, for seasons, appointed times. The idea is that He's bringing order in the context of time and the passing of time. But they also create a separation between light and darkness, and even further separation of light and darkness, so that they are where they belong in order. On the fifth day, He limits the domain of the sea and sky creatures to the sea and the sky, keeping them where they belong in creation. And again, He limits their ability to reproduce according to their own kind, bringing further order and peace within the context of the propagation of life. On the sixth day, He limits the domain of the land creatures and man to land, making sure they remain in their proper domain. And once again, He limits their ability to reproduce according to their kind alone, bringing even further order within the context of the propagation of life. But again, man is created, man sins, rebels, and disobeys God. And in so doing, he brings chaos back into creation. Disorder, destruction, and conflict enter into the world. Conflicts between family members, between tribes, between nations. Peace was wrenched from the world because of the sin of man. It's now me and mine at the expense of you and yours. Whatever it takes. But immediately we see that our God, the God of peace, intervenes and enters into creation to bring about peace, to bring about wholeness and completeness and settledness through His purposeful efforts. Genesis 9, we see that there will be a judgment on the murderer. That brings justice into creation. So when things go wrong, order can be restored. In Torah, we see the sacrifices and the offerings given in order to restore peace in the relationship between God and man. In fact, there's a specific type of offering called a peace offering. Prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel refer to the covenants of the Lord as Covenants of peace. In other words, they're covenants that bring peace between God and man in relationship. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans called the kingdom of God a kingdom of peace. In other words, a kingdom that brings about wholeness and completeness and settledness through purposeful effort. And we see God described as the God of peace over and again throughout the Scriptures. But let's back up just a little bit. Please note that man is at enmity with God. There is a conflict between God and man in the fall. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, the Ephesians, the Colossians, he wrote the same basic idea that the fall of man made man the enemy of God. Peace was shattered between the two. 
And the only way, ultimately, that this was going to be resolved was through Christ. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 9, described him as the prince of peace. The slave of Yahweh who would come to restore peace between God and man. In chapter 53, he wrote that the Lord Jesus, this prince of peace, would make peace with God on our behalf through his sacrifice, his suffering, and death. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, For if while being enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more being reconciled will we be saved in his life. There is reconciliation that happens between man and God, a restoration of a peaceful, whole, complete, and settled relationship because of the work of Christ. Christ is the bringer of peace, but not just between God and man, but also He gives peace to man so that He might live at peace in a world of chaos. So we read in the Gospel of John, the words of Jesus, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or be afraid. In other words, the world can't give you peace. The world is a source of chaos. Only he can give peace to you in the midst of all that chaos. A little bit later on, John recorded these words. These things I have spoken to you in order that you should have peace in me. In this world you have tribulation, but be courageous, I have conquered the world. Again, the world is going to be troublesome and chaotic and and just destructively awful. And yet, Christ gives his peace. Nicholas Ridley died in 1555. He was burned at the stake for his beliefs in Christ. The night before he was to be executed, his brother came to him in prison and offered to be with with him there to comfort him and to console him because very likely he was going to be doubled up on the floor in the straw and the muck and crying and weeping and, and panicking. And so he wanted to be able to comfort him with prayer and words of consolation, but Ridley looked at him and actually told him he wasn't interested. In fact, Ridley said he intended to have the most pleasant night of sleep he'd ever had before. And then the next morning he was burned at the stake. How could he do this? How could a man know that he was going to be strapped to a post, lit on fire, flesh burning off of his bones, and yet be such at peace. It was because he had the peace of Christ, a peace that surpasses all understanding. He had this peace. But the problem is we tend to try to find peace in the chaotic places of the world. We don't even necessarily have to face death as Ridley did. But we panic and head immediately to the places that only produce more chaos. We'll run to family and friends that just stir up more drama and gossip. And unfortunately, many of us just enjoy the drama anyway. Or we might decide, well, I'm just going to busy myself to distract myself, but then things just get more chaotic, and then I start missing things, and then it gets more chaotic, and things get missed, and it's just bad. Or maybe you take the stoic approach. Oh, well, I don't have any control over everything, so I'm just going to control me and how I react to things. That's what I can do. And and then in the process of that, the chaos just continues to get worse and spins out of control. The solution is to find peace in Jesus. For those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus, your chaos will simply continue. It will not get better. If you continue to operate in the world looking for peace somewhere out there, you will not find it. There is no peace to be had coming from this world at all. They offer nothing but chaos. The only source of peace to be had is Jesus himself. That is why we call you to him. But here's here's what's even worse, more important. It's not just that you will not have peace in this world. It's that you will have no peace with God himself, the Lord of all creation, the Holy One, enthroned on high above all creation, who will judge the living and the dead. You stand in a broken and shattered relationship with that very God. And what's worse is you still stand under condemnation of your sin, and the wrath to come will be upon you. 
And so this is why we implore you and we beg you to be reconciled to God in Christ so that you might have peace with God, most importantly. For those of you who have long walked with the Lord, please remember you can have peace with Christ too because of the life He has secured in His death, burial, and resurrection. You're not done seeking the peace of Christ because you, brothers and sisters, still live in a world of tribulation and hardship and suffering and difficulties. You need Christ and His peace. Have you availed yourself of His peace? In the letter of the Hebrews, we read, and I summarize here, that Christ has secured a reconciled peace with our God that we might come boldly before Him to bring our concerns, our fears, our worries, our pains. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, be anxious with regard to nothing, but in all things, in prayer and in supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God surpassing all understanding will guard your hearts and your thinking in Christ Jesus. We are able to have peace in the midst of chaos, suffering, affliction, and persecution of this world because we have secured in Christ a life eternal in the kingdom of God, which no one can take from us. This is why we can have peace in this world. This is why we can stand as a lowly island of complete peace in the midst of a horrible torrent of violent, chaotic hurricane is because we know what we have in Christ cannot be taken from us. The life we have in Him eternally in His kingdom and the life we have with Him abundantly in relationship with Him can never be taken from us, and that's why we can have peace. So brothers and sisters, I beg you, throw yourself upon the loving kindness, grace, and mercy of the Lord that you might find peace in Him and nowhere else. We have light, life, and peace from a God who is profoundly driven to bring light to darkness, life to lifelessness, and peace to chaos. And so, we come to this table today as our first response to what we have heard this day. We come to this table to rejoice that Yahweh is a God of light, that Yahweh is a God of life, and that Yahweh is a God of peace. We come to this table to rejoice and praise the Lord God who is profoundly driven to bring light to darkness, life to lifelessness, and peace to chaos. But as we do so, we also need to come soberly to this table and rightly confess how we've sought light, life, and peace in the dark, lifeless, and chaotic places of the world. Brothers and sisters, we've all of us sought truth and deliverance from lostness, deception, confusion, despair, falsehood, and suffering in the dark places of the world rather than in the light of Christ. We've all of us sought life in the lifeless places of the world rather than finding true life in the person of Christ. And we've all of us sought peace in the chaotic places of the world rather than finding peace in the very person of Christ. And everywhere we've looked, we've been left wanting. We've been left in greater darkness, greater lifelessness, greater chaos. And what's worse is we failed to come in faith and obedience to our Lord. So let's take time to confess that rightly as we come to this table. And by His grace, let us repent and commit to turning from those sins and seek His forgiveness. And in so doing, let us also seek His grace that we might indeed come before Him seeking His light, life, and peace now and in the days to come. Let's come to this table and celebrate and give praise and thanks to Jesus who is our light, life, and peace. As those who are helping with the table come forward today, we read the words of the Apostle Paul again from the letter to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was handed over, took bread, and giving thanks, he broke and said, This is my body on your behalf, this do for remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. 
This do as often as you drink it for remembrance of me. For as often as you should eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until when he should come. Therefore, whoever should eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 